towards the end of the day. Good morning, I'm your host Yusuf Alam, and with me today is Marilyn, Abraham, John, and Kevin. And today's topics are police brutality, ISIS, terrorism, and domestic violence. So hi, I'm Yusuf Alam, and in today's show we will be talking about police brutality and if it has become a major problem in the United States. Is it better to be safe than sorry, or are the police using too much force and unnecessary violence to enforce the law? Those are just some issues we will be talking about. With me today is Abraham John and whatever. First, let's talk about the issue with Michael Brown and Ferguson. A while back, an unarmed teenager, Michael Brown, was shot and killed by the police. There are many stories to this. Witnesses claim that the officers threatened to shoot him and that he had his hands up. And even in the autopsy, it showed that he was shot in the back in a running position. At the same time, however, police claimed that there was a fight and that the officer had no choice. What do you guys think? Well, it says that he fired multiple shots which I think was unnecessary and pretty brutal of the officer. Also, there are many uh, more ways to deal with him than to shoot him. If the officer's case was true, the officer could have just pepper sprayed him or tased him. Plus, police officers always have a partner with them. I'm sure two trained police officers could have handled an unarmed teenager. So I do find that pretty brutal. Yeah, I agree. There are many more solutions than shooting him. I mean, he was unarmed. If he had a weapon and he's going to use it, I can understand the use of deadly force, but he had no weapon. And all this part's even more violence at Ferguson. Stores were robbed, there were fires, people died, and there was absolute chaos. And yes, we do need the police to protect us, but do it the right way. We don't need someone to be shot with their hands up in broad daylight for committing a crime. That's practically barbaric. Agreed. Anyone that would say anyone would say that there are smarter and more peaceful solutions to the Michael Brown case than to kill him in broad daylight. If I were them, I'd consider this a murder case rather than protection. And what about the courts? They've let lots of people get away with the murders of innocent, unarmed people. Let's take it way back to a very old case, the case with Trayvon Martin. Yes, this is not a case with actual police brutality, but it shows how the court systems can allow the police officer to escape from the case untouched. A while back in 2012, Trayvon Martin, also an unarmed teenager, was shot and killed by another civilian, George Zimmerman, for threatening him. John, would you like to finish the story? Yes, apparently the two got into an altercation and Zimmerman shot him. However, Zimmerman started the altercation, yet he was still released with, without any charges, which doesn't make sense at all to me. Either way, it's a very controversial case. Also, Zimmerman was told not to exit his vehicle or approach Martin, yet he disregarded the police's instructions. Either way, it's a very controversial case, but it supports the brutality towards African Americans and other minorities as well. What do you guys think? Do you think that police brutality is mainly towards minorities or towards all races? Well, I don't know what to think, but I do believe that if Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown were white, none of this would have happened to them. It's the stereotype that, be that people believe African Americans are linked to crime that causes the these discriminations and brutalities. Yeah, I agree with Marilyn. I think that if there are, they were white and innocent looking, that none of the brutality would have happened to them. Now, let's talk about a recent case, the Eric Garner case. First, let's watch the video. I think that it has become really misconstrued. What is truth? Where are you getting your news from? Go to the people. Ask us what we're going through. That's not even No. Um, what do you guys think about this? My name is Nina. Honestly, I believe that this was completely unnecessary. The force that the officer used was extremely excessive and not called for. Agreed. Eric Garner can clearly be heard saying that he can't breathe, that the police continue to put him in a chokehold. I, I, I actually think that he said it at least 20 times, 17 times. Yeah. In fact, in New York particularly, the chokehold maneuver was banned in 1993 from all police officers, making this case even worse. Oh, there's a I'm sorry. I didn't show anything. I did nothing. We sitting here the whole time. Why did I miss it? Who told you? Who got your cigarette to? To whom? He's in my heart away from what? Every time you see me, you want to mess with me. I'm tired of it. It's time today. This guy right here is forcibly trying to lock somebody up for breaking up a fight. 
Everybody standing here, they told you I didn't do nothing. I did not sell nothing. Because every time you see me, you want to harass me, you want to stop me, you want to sell cigarettes. I'm minding my business, officer. I'm minding my business. Please just leave me alone. I told you the last time, please just leave me alone. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't touch me, please. Don't touch me. Put your hand behind your back. It's not blue. It's not blue. It's not blue. It's not blue. You can hear him saying it's not blue. It's not blue. Once again, police being up on people. He's in the truck. Back up right here. Back up and get on that step. Okay. Back up. All he did was break up a fight. And this is what happens for breaking up a fight. This is crazy. can't breathe. Look, now I mean, they gave this man a seizure. Yo, move out the way! Yo. It's my brother, we Everybody, live here. You know what? Back up this way. Everybody now, back up. It's now gonna become a crisis. Back, back, back it up! Back it up! I'm going to my house. No, no, no. This way. Let's go. Can't go in my house? house or that way? All right, I call pick it that a, way. Pick a choice. I'm gonna get my Let's bike. Go. You had your chance to get your bike, sir. Staying over there right now. We have to see you. Excuse me. Honestly, if the police officer is in charge with homicide, it is a clear case of brutality. And it is a clear case of the court systems accepting this brutality as well. So I ask the big question now. Based on these stories, do you think that the police are being brutal and using excessive force, or are they just being safe rather than sorry? I believe that the police are being brutal. Michael Brown was shot multiple times and he's unarmed. What shouldn't have happened? The officer could have pepper sprayed him or used a team. All religious but are not educated. I agree as well. Eric Gardner kept pleading to the officer that he was just breaking up a fight and not selling anything. Yet the officer decided to choke and kill him. A maneuver banned over 20 years ago. And he can clearly be heard saying he can't breathe. I agree as well. While the police do protect us and are needed, sometimes they use far too excessive force, which needs to stop. Well, that, that wraps up my show. On the panel with me is Abraham, Marilyn, and John, and on the board is Laura and Joshua. And off to the next show, which is Marilyn's show on domestic violence. <clears throat> Good morning. This is the Laughing Hyena show. With me today, I have John Lawless, Abraham El Gimbahi, okay. Yusuf Alon, and... On the board, I have Laura Pasco and Joshua. I'll start you off today with some background on my co-hosts. John Lawless is a sophomore in high-tech high school, one of my greatest friends, and we have many classes together. Abraham is also one of my best friends and a sophomore at high-tech. These boys make me laugh till I have tears in my eyes. Yusuf Alam is the future point guard for the Knicks. Not He's true. a sophomore at high tech at high tech and loves the Knicks more than his mom. That's not true. Laura is the smartest and most responsible person in this class. She loves working with the board. Today we will be discussing a very important matter, professional athletes getting the special treatment when it comes to domestic violence. There has been dozens of domestic violence uh, charges press pressed on professional athletes, more specifically football players and MMA fighters. Obviously this justifies not the action, but their behavior, their profession, what they've worked out their whole life includes many physical force and a lot includes mainly physical for force and a lot of it MMA fighters throw punches throw punches for a living and it becomes second nature to them they automatically want to throw their fist up when they get aggravated football players are football players ir irritability are much higher than the average person in their profession irritability is taken out by ramming the guy into the floor because of this their loved ones become victims this is ridiculous. For example, former Baltimore Ravens running back Ray Rice has won his appeal of an indefinite suspension has been reinstated to the NFL. Yes, he states, I would like to thank Judge Barbara Jones, the NFL Players Association, my attorneys, agents, advisors, family, friends, and fans, but most importantly, my wife, Janae. Rice said in a statement released by the NFLPA on Friday, 
I made an inexcusable mistake and I accept full responsibility for my actions. I am thankful that there was a proper appeals process in place to address this issue. I will continue working hard to improve myself and be the best husband, father, and friend while giving back to my com community and helping others to learn from my mistakes. Just hours after Rice knocked out his then fiance with a left hook at the Revel Casino Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey, the Baltimore Ravens director of security Darren Sanders reached an Atlantic City police officer by phone. While watching surveillance video shot from inside the elevator where Rice's punch knocked his fiance unconscious, the officer who told Sanders he just happened to be a Ravens fan described in detail to Sanders what he was seeing. There's even a video of him knocking out his girlfriend too. And before they get in the elevator, you can see Ray Ray spit in Janae's face. I think twice, actually. Right there. Professional athletes are held at a higher pedestal than others when it comes to felonies and assaults. For example, Chad Johnson, he had about his wife. He only received a one-year sentence. Jason Kidd broke his wife's ribs and smashed her head on a car dashboard, only given six months of court-mandated anger management therapy. Will Smith, defensive end of the Patriots, dragged his wife by her hair for many blocks, but it's okay because he completed a diversion program, right? A.J. Jefferson strangled his wife. Lance Stevenson raped a girl from his college and was charged with felony assault, menacing, and harassment after pushing the mother of his child down a flight of chair. Floyd Mayweather beat his wife. O.J. Simpson murdered his wife. War Machine left his wife with 18 broken bones, missing teeth, and a ruptured liver. Hope Solo beat her half-sister and met nephew. If they were sentenced to time in jail, their sentence was shortened. Lance Stevenson was awarded a scholarship and still is in the NBA. They think it's okay to do this because they have the money for bail, therapy, and fines. Ridiculous. Unbelievable. Okay. Thanks for watching. Uh, the Laughing Hyenas. I'm your show. I'm your host, Marilyn, and thank you to my board, Abe, Yusuf, and John. All right. Off to the next show, which is Kevin's. Well, basically, my show was on the Paris attack. Um, I'll fill you in a little bit. Uh, the attack started at 11:30. They went to the office of. Charlie Hebdo killed a man in the street senselessly. He was hurting in the floor. Um, they shot him brutally in the head. Then they went inside. They went inside the, his office and kept about 20 something hostages and called specific names. They called for about nine people and they executed them on the spot. Then they tried to run away and got into a gunfight with some cops, but were able to get away from that. They uh, hid in a shed and were found after six hours of search. Yeah. On video, you could see um, the youngest, he got out of the car saying, this is for Muhammad. Of course, that's what this is all about and he shot the cop and he ran over to the cop who was on the ground begging for his life and shot him at point blank range. Seriously injured. The police were quickly on the scene, only to come under attack themselves. Images posted on social media capture the drama. Eyewitnesses have been describing what they saw. A neighbor called to warn me that there were armed men in the building and that we 
we had to shut all the doors. And several minutes later, there were several shots heard in the building from automatic weapons firing in all directions. It was really upsetting. You'd think it was a war zone. Charlie Hebdo, a satirical magazine, has been attacked before. Just over three years ago, its premises were firebombed after it published a caricature of the Prophet Mohammed. Shortly after this morning's attack, the French president came to issue a message of defiance on behalf of his nation. This is an act of an exceptional barbarism that has just happened here in Paris against a newspaper. A newspaper means free speech against journalists who have always endeavoured to to show that in France you can operate to defend their ideas. The gunmen escaped in a stolen car. They're now being pursued by the police across Paris. John Brain, BBC News. More on this is that the person that was said to be working with them goes by the name Koulibaly, uh, who kept hostages in a grocery store with his girlfriend, Boumedian. Boumedian was able, able to escape by running away with the crowd and is said to be in Syria right now. Um, also, later reports say that she exchanged 500 phone calls with uh, one of the brother's wife. Yeah. Pretty much it. Uh, and also, Koulibaly said they were working with uh, Al-Qaeda but um, the brothers said that they were working for ISIS, so maybe there is a, a um, maybe they're working together now, which could cause many, many problems. Okay, um, I'll take the next show, which is John Lawless talking about terrorism. Okay, so, hello everyone, I'm John Lawless, and um, today we'll be talking about terrorism. Um, what is terrorism? The actual definition of terrorism is the use of violence and intimidation in the pursuit of political arms. Do you guys think that's a, a good enough de definition for that? What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah I think um, it's when you bring terrorism down to a, a base, and that's, that's basically where it all starts off. So, uh, someone doesn't agree with what's going on in their government and if they don't get their way the first time they ask for it they're gonna react violently but i mean what, what just happened in paris that that was nothing political that was like religious so that it was in a well, political newspaper yeah all right we, we we have a video that it gets um multiple people from across the world's definition on terrorism that has become really misconstrued. What is truth? Where are you getting your news from? Go to the people. Ask us what we're going through. We asked people around the world what they thought the big issues were. This is one of them. I live in Israel. Tokyo, Japan. I'm in London, in England. I'm living in Kabul, Afghanistan. We're in Mexico City. Now I don't feel safe in, in my everyday life. Terrorism is a worldwide problem. My name is Lin Fatou, also known as Malika, and I'm here in Beirut City, Lebanon. You see, when you go to people that are religious but are not educated because they come from the lower class, and you tell them, if you don't do that, God will put you in, in hell, you'll do anything. Security is mostly a superstition. The main goal of terrorism is to alter the status quo. I have two options. The first option is bad, and the second, more bad. My name is Sammy Halaby. We're here in Beirut, Lebanon. The root causes of terrorism are socioeconomic and religious. Because they don't have a knowledge, education, whatever their elders say, they do that. Wow, how to say it in English? It's the human mind and soul that are not taken care of. Um, so after watching that video, you guys still think that that's a good enough definition? in political pursuit of political arms. 
Well, I mean, some terrorists like ISIS and Al Qaeda, they, they don't do it for political reasons. They do it for religious reasons. Because what they believe, which is wrong, but what they believe is that um, anyone who isn't Muslim should be killed. But that's obviously wrong. That's obviously not true. Well, to them, to us, it's obviously religious because they believe that everyone who isn't Muslim should be killed. But to them, that's a political. That's a, a political thing. That's what they believe should that's how the that's it's how they think it should be what really caught my attention in the video was the little kid holding the gun yeah they brainwashed the young and it starts from previous generations from when it all started i guess for example 9 11 people were saying to their sons that america's bad and it's a it's ridiculous it's a really messed up situation um, well they I, ISIS is said to have a ten-year-old executing people already. Mm -hmm. so. oh. uh, that's all we have. Well, uh, thank you for watching, and thanks to our panel, Marilyn, Abraham, John, and Kevin. And uh, I'm Yusuf Alem, and this is when we, we, when we will realize. Bye, Mr. Puccino. Bye. Have oh, oh, we love you, Mr. Pucci. We're going to miss you forever. You're the boy.